you're going to tell me that a golf ball that is faster may not actually go further. Is that correct? Yeah, it may go further. What? Hey, everybody, what is happening? No putts given. How you living? It's Monday. We're recording on Monday, publishing Wednesday. Tony and Chris, Golf Spy T, Golf Spy C. We were a good 10 minutes into this already, and <laughs> I forgot to hit record. So, oops, here we go. Man, we had some good stuff in there, too. I I apologize to everybody that uh, I'm not going to be able to remember every every quality thing we said there in the last uh, 10 minutes that didn't re- get recorded. 10 minutes of our lives will never get back, Tony. Sorry. Oh, well. That's all right. This is what it is. Lot, lots to talk about. The ball speed conundrum kind of a new take on a current topic anthony kim makes a comeback of sorts ish we're gonna give him a grade in grades and discuss the cognizant finished up on monday austin eck wrote one were you aware tony of the cognizant being I, called know, the I, cognizant? I totally lost track i was not consciously cognizant of the fact that this is the honda or what used to be the honda um, and I have no idea. I, I mean, I know what Honda is. I own a number of Hondas. I currently own, with seven daughters, several old model Hondas. I do not own a the Cognizant, so I don't, I don't totally know what that is. And we got some quick questions. Well, and we have some quick questions. <laughs> Maybe not quick answers, but some quick questions. Uh. So let's start with this ball speed conundrum. And here's why I'm calling it a, a little bit of a conundrum. Set the stage a little bit. Typical cadence for ball manufacturers is every other year. So roughly every 24 months in terms of bringing a new ball to market. This year, 2024, is opposite for Titleist, meaning 23, 25, assumably 27. It's the year everybody else prefers to release a golf ball, or most everybody else. Which makes sense, right? I mean, Titleist is a 800-pound gorilla at retail, on tour. Um, Jay Wall, I think you saw this tweet as well. He recently uh, posted something. What did you say? Eight out of nine? Yeah, so we got, yeah, I think probably everybody got the same email from Titleist, although Jay Wall may have this info at his fingertips because he is pretty entrenched with the, the goings-on of tour. But, yeah, so eight of eight of the first nine tour events – 2024 won with a Titleist golf ball. Mm-hmm. So, again... Including the Cognizant Classic. Including, were you aware? Including the Cognizant. So, that's what the, that's again, what the AI just mention that to, again, set the stage, right? That Titleist is, is the 800-pound gorilla. So, and we've mentioned this before, if you're a ball manufacturer, not named Titleist that's coming out with a ball in kind of the opposite year of Titleist, you can't just make a ball and make it as good. There has to be something that you're trying to do to get people to switch, right? It has to somehow be better. So if you were sitting in those rooms with those R&D teams and they're asking you, hey, we want to come out with a ball, but we got to make it better, what does better look like to you? Yeah, that's a complicated question. And so, I mean, we've talked about this. It's it's not easy to overcome history, perception, et cetera. And so I think at, at a basic level, and, and certainly in the case of Callaway, Chrome Tour X in particular, right, better, better looks like more ball speed. It looks like more greenside spin. At least that's the story that's being told. We've seen it when we tested them. Um, but it, it may not tell the whole story of the golf ball. And that, that's where it, it gets complicated. And again, that's why everybody that, that's trying to compete, trying to show benefit, is also trying to keep it simple so that it's, it's easily understood. Even if it's not necessarily a complete picture, but it's an understandable picture. Yeah, so, and you're going to have to help me understand this a little bit too, because when I hear ball speed... And I see somebody getting another two, three, four miles an hour of ball speed, particularly off a driver, right? And we see it in testing. We see it in, you know, graphics on 
television broadcasts and things. Oh, ball speed, 185, ball speed, 182, ball speed, whatever it was. But you're going to tell me that just because a ball has more ball speed, that doesn't make it longer. Not necessarily. Right? It can. Is that what you're going to tell me? I mean, we're, when you're talking about high compression tour balls, so you know your, your X balls, things like that, you are already, wherever you were last year, two years ago, you were already flirting with the USGA distance limit. So adding more speed, you're still you're still limited because unlike the, the driver rules where there's some room to negotiate and navigate loopholes and you know explore, we've talked about the, the gap between CT and COR and those sorts of really obscure yeah. details. Ball testing is simple. Like it is it is hit under a certain configuration and if it goes farther than the limit, that's the end of it, right? There's no there's new no nuance to that. It's it's pass fail. And so if you add ball speed and you're already right at or near that limit, something else has to give, which is, you know, okay, maybe maybe we put some more spin into it. That's that's a way to to gain speed, but not necessarily appreciable difference, right? You're just kind of changing the performance characteristics, something sure. with your arrow maybe, where you get a little different trajectory that doesn't necessarily fly as far off a driver, things like that. So yeah, you can absolutely add speed without adding, and, and significant speed too, like a golf ball, mm-hmm. one mile an hour, two, three, that's, that's yeah. no small number, but you have to yeah. do that in a way that doesn't, by design, does not add a whole lot of distance. And so that's, you know, that, that's kind of the nuanced piece of it, I guess. Yeah, and I think, too, to that point, it's like, okay, when we talk about total distance of a golf ball, certainly ball speed has a lot to do with it, right? If, you know, if somebody has 180 mile an hour ball speed and somebody else has 160 mile an hour ball speed, arrow, anything isn't going to make up <laughs> for that particular difference, right? Like, that is probably, right, that's the main driver, but you mentioned two other things, which was spin and arrow. Like how important are those in terms of total distance? Both matter. I mean, right. Speed is speed is that's, it's the heaviest part of the equation for sure. But obviously, right. We've, we've seen balls that you you can think speed, strong correlation to compression, but we see, you know, balls of equivalent compression have significant differences in distance. And you can say, you know, even say similar ball speeds have mm-hmm. very disparate total distance numbers because of those other things. One may spin significantly more, spin significantly less, fly higher, fly lower, flatter, whatever you want to call it, right? Just those other pieces of the total distance equation come into play. It's not strictly just a, hey, the fastest ball is always the longest ball. Because if if your goal is is the fastest ball, all you got to do is jack right. up compression. Right, right. Right, you need, just make it. You need to do. You need golf balls to do other things, and to an extent, when you look at the totality of a manufacturer's lineup, you don't just need to be fast. You also need to be different, right? You've got to create that differentiation between your other products, so that you've actually given golfers something to choose between, rather mm-hmm. than three balls that you know all fly more or less the same. And I think for the most part, everybody yeah. does a good job of that. Yeah. No, for sure. And I think. Um... I mean, I guess so to, to get right to it, like here's a question is, let's say that I do get a couple more miles per hour of ball speed. And right, we're seeing companies, I mean, Rory said, I want to say, you know, that new TP5, TP5X, whichever one he's in, gets him another half a club on his irons. I had a buddy that did a, you know, one of the tests with the Chrome Tour ball this weekend against the current ball that he was playing. Yep, also saw, you know, a couple mile per hour increase in ball speed. So the question he asked me was, hey, I got a couple more miles per hour ball speed. Should I switch? I mean, because that's ultimately a question, right? Because you're not going (laughs) to, you can't hit two golf balls on the same shot. So should I, you know, should I switch from the one that I was playing to this one that's a little bit faster? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. And that's that's the tricky part because oh yeah, give speed is good. I want more speed. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if we look again specifically talking about the test that you and I and your friend have gone through now with the testing Chrome Soft X versus in right. our case Pro V One X, was it faster? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I didn't. I didn't do that portion of the test. I saw you mm-hmm. hit it faster. We both mm-hmm. did the green side portion. We both saw right. more spin. So that gives me 
my tee shot and you know my 50 yard i missed the green or i hit my tee shot really close to the green right the green side aspect but there's a whole lot that goes on in between and then there's the other piece we talked about right does is that ball speed component am i also optimized for trajectory and spin so it's a hell of a good starting place if you say i'm going to start you with more speed and i'm going mm-hmm. to start you with more green side spin i am absolutely yep. curious now for me, I can tell you Chrome Soft X in particular, that ball spins too much for me. Super interested in Chrome Tour. Mm-hmm. You give me those two things, I'm interested, but I also want to see what happens in the in between. Like, right. right. How does it perform on irons? You know, does it even, I, I've always said for, for average golfers, hybrid performance, like whatever that, you know, whatever you're hitting in that four or five spot in your bag, mm-hmm. that, that's where I tend to see a lot of difference. Um, if you're consistent enough, right? I realize not everybody is tuned sure. in and sees the difference, but it is there, and that's where I, I've I've seen it a lot in golf balls. And then obviously, when you get into those those short iron approach shots, so it's yeah, speed is good, spin yeah. is good at either end. Right. But what happens in the middle? And I think it's not to say the middle is the only thing that matters, but it's again, you you need to see the totality of the equation, which is why every manufacturer recommends like. Go mm-hmm. out. Yeah. All right. You got some launch monitor numbers. Mm-hmm. That, that's going to tell you what your starting point is, what you're working with, whether or not it might be right, whether or not there may right. be a benefit. But ultimately, you need to take those out onto the golf course, play real yeah. holes with them and see what happens. Even like our robot test, right? We're we're here to show you those comparative differences. This one's faster. It spins more, flies higher, lower. Right. But from that, go, all right, based on this information, here are the two or three that might be right for me. Go out on the course, play. So again, I love more speed. I love more spin, but you also need, I want to see the rest of the picture. Should you switch? Should you not? It, to me, it's like a golf ball that goes faster. It's easy to go out. Just look at that and say, yes, if it goes faster, it's going to go further, which again, that's not a guarantee. It's a good start. I mean, Mm -hmm. okay. Damn good start. (laughs) It's a damn good start because you it's really hard to get more ball speed other than, you know, like if they engineer that in there, obviously great, but if you swing it fast or whatever, but if just a ball is going to give you a couple, two, three miles an hour, you didn't have to do anything different. It seems to me like it would be hard to lose that throughout the rest of the bag. But the other piece we didn't even get to yet is manufacturing consistency. Am I going to get that ball speed and that performance on every shot? And I know, you know, we haven't had time to look through that in Ball Lab yet, but what's your, you know, current state of affairs in terms of running balls through Ball Lab and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there it's in process. So Rob is is our Ball Lab guy now. We've got we've got Callaway, I think, probably into the second dozen. So you know, as as most people know, we space out those orders to make sure that we're not just pulling from three dozen that were manufactured at basically the same time. So. Working through those, TP5s have been ordered, Bridgestone has been ordered, so it's in process mm-hmm. and, and we'll have all that pretty quickly. And I'm, I'm for sure interested in seeing what we find, um, especially, like we've talked about the Callaway story for years and the quality and, and how we have seen that steadily improving. And it has been two years since we last ran Callaway balls, Callaway, you know, Chrome, Chrome Tour, whatever we're calling them this week, right? right. <laughs> uh, Chrome Soft. Um, through ball lab. So we'll see. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, it's funny. We talk about these increases in performance. We talk about potential, you know, benefits of more distance and all that kind of stuff. And they're still right. It's, it's still our understanding. That's all going to come to a screeching halt here in what appears to be not super long. I mean, again, so I'm talking Mm -hmm. about the ball rollback. I'm talking about, what exactly that is right there's no reason to suggest that that's not going to happen at this point right i'm i remain it's unsettled as much as the usga and rna have said this is how it is it is it is not written in stone yet because uh, all avenues have not been exhausted and and whether or not those avenues will be pursued i don't know there is some chatter but i said i consider it unsettled it's a blueprint uh but uh, i wouldn't say the uh the construction piece of it hasn't hasn't started. Yeah, and we're gonna. I think you're gonna specifically dive into 
more of actually trying to quantify what this would look like for golfers. Like we haven't really gone down. It, everything's been theoretical to this point of, hey, you're going to lose X. You're going to lose Y. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And to actually be able to give people some kind of, you know, a, a reasonable picture of, okay, well, here's maybe what that would look like for me. We're yeah, going to dig think, into you know, that. We'll touch on it. Like the fascinating thing to me is you think, oh, and I think this is kind of what the rollback crowd part of it wants to see perception of artistry return mm-hmm. to the game but uh, and i know it's, it's not a crowd that embraces data necessarily uh, right but when you run the numbers and look at it from a stroke strictly from a strokes game perspective what those what sure. that data tells us is that the rollback in in one sense has the opposite of what has been said to be the desired effect that is it's going to like hey distance is is too important in today's game we need to dial it back right uh, mm-hmm. But if you run those strokes gain calculations, look at the math, you actually uh, rolling back the golf ball by call it 5%, whatever the number is, you look at those strokes gain tables, it's not a massive number, but you've actually right. increased the strokes gain advantage for the longest hitters. So, right. Pretty yeah. interesting. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something if by rolling back a golf ball, you actually took the one part of the game that you said was too important or had become too important and you made it? Even Just, fractionally more important. Like it not is, and it, it is fractions, but but still, yeah. Damn you, math. So stay tuned. Stay tuned for the math. The cognizant. I want to talk about this just very, very quickly. Shorter topic here. In between a couple longer topics. The cognizant. Were you aware of a Monday finish? Austin Eckro uh, played fantastic. Coming down the stretch, there were weather delays. I have no idea why the tour didn't put them off split tees and threesomes on Sunday morning, knowing that there was weather coming, but what do I know? Uh, side note, one of my favorite parts of watching this yesterday was there's a number of players that are in the field or in the field for the Cognizant that are also part of the Seminole Pro member event just down the road. And so one of which was like Rory McIlroy, a couple others. So you saw these guys like running, trying to finish their round before uh, – daylight expired because like hey if you got to come back monday morning seminal uh, pro member is is out but uh austin eck wrote one good job austin another yeah i mean this is like let, let's just real briefly speak that we've talked about this i've said it before right this is this is the honda now the cognizant would have been one of the the higher quality filler events, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you know, if you're the PGA Tour, this is not the leaderboard you want by any stretch of the imagination. And and all I make of this is that you know when if this battle, if you want to call it that, live versus the PGA Tour, it it has to be a winner take all. It absolutely has to be that way. Otherwise, you have you know two competing tours that are half as interesting as either one should be <laughs> right so, yeah this right. is this is what we get this is what you get this is what you're mm-hmm. going to see on live from time to time as well you know sometimes you're going to get the leaderboard you want sometimes you're not it's going to be true on both sides and you know if and the reality is it provides very little incentive to watch either right now yeah it you know and, and from an equipment standpoint i just found this you know quickly interesting obviously austin he is a ping staffer so no surprise to see ping clubs in his bag but did have a mix set of the blueprint t and the blueprint s irons we're seeing those show up in more and more staffers bags for ping it seems like the blueprints are resonating with that but the bigger point to me was all of his clubs all 14 of them were ping you don't see too many 14 club contracts anymore no, and it may not be. Right? Like I don't know as for sure is it fourteen or he just likes all fourteen. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Didn't sneak a hybrid in there? Fairway with some. Anyway, thought that was potentially interesting. So, all right, we said last week Anthony Kim back from the dead in terms of professional golf was off. You know, disappeared off the map for over a decade. Nobody really saw him, heard from him, you know, all those kind of things. And he's back. He came back. He came Is back he, last week. He, he played golf in a professional tournament. I think that's... He played golf in a professional tournament on live. What do you give him? 
Give him a grade. A through F. Give I'm, him I'm a grade. I'm going to give him, uh, and this is this may be too kind, but I'm trying to cut the guy a break because I, I, I realize like 10 years plus is a long time to be away. But you look at the numbers. 16 over. 33 shots off the lead. And so I look over at that as three like, rounds. Yeah. He, he'd need to be 25 strokes plus better over the course of three rounds to be competitive. And... And it just, to me, is like, fundamentally he's good for golf, I think, especially if he has, kind of maintains the personality he had 10 years ago. If AK is still AK, that's right. awesome. But you can't, you can't go out there and, and lose by 33 strokes. If, if that is the pattern that develops, and yeah, it's sample size of one tournament. So there's, sure. there's lots of room there to improve, as there is for any C-minus situation. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 not a great looking start, and I think it's it's probably what we expected. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's it's still not great. So I'm going to give Anthony Kim a C, and the caveat is this: he can replace that C with a higher grade down the road. Because my thinking, you're right. I mean, it's this first tournament is kind of what we expected i didn't expect him to come out and shoot 65 65 and and be in contention that was the you best kind of wanted scenario. him to though right like i wanted him like, to yeah. i thought that that would have been the best story that would have been phenomenal it would have been in line with the mystique that you know so many people kind of trotted out or, or kind of characterized him you know with in terms of coming back but you know 76 mid 70s three rounds in a row 33 shots out of you know contention dfl by by more than a little too you know that by more than a little yeah i mean <laughs> he could have come out and shot 80 80 80 and i don't think the narrative would be much different you know uh my thing is this it's really the the energy and the excitement around it was really really cool there were people again that got up at three in the morning to watch and to see this and that's awesome no, it's the that, first time I've ever in bed. And again, not every live tournament happens in Saudi Arabia, but it is the first time I've ever looked at a live leaderboard. It's the first time I've cared enough, legitimately. Yeah. So yeah, because I wanted you wanted to see. Now that amount of goodwill is going to dissipate exceptionally quickly if he doesn't start shooting com- some compelling scores. Because Anthony Kim shooting seventy to seventy five and finishing in the back half of every field in a three round tournament kind of, you know after three four tournaments five tournaments I, I i think that goodwill is gone so i'm giving him a c right now because that's kind of what i expected super average cut him a little slack that's fine but it's going to become an a or an f in three four i, I don't see him staying in this situation he's either mm-hmm. going to improve and it sounds like you know maybe he will maybe he wants to work on it do that stuff i hope he does i again i think that would be really good for golf now i will say that paying him millions of dollars getting him you know entrance into a field guy who hasn't swung a golf club you know professionally in a competitive environment in in the last decade it doesn't do a whole lot for me in terms of like why live should get world ranking points no like it's, it doesn't definitely it sort of argues against right like uh you know well we we pay these guys to show up give them points you know anthony kim didn't earn his way in no. other than you know a, a name he built 10 years ago plus that is and again we, we've we've talked about this right the legend exceeds the reality at this point anyway right so right. It, it's real tough to to say like oh yeah let's let's give him the ranking points and i think you know, Eamon Lynch wrote an article last week shortly after um, the Anthony Kim thing became finalized, legit, definitely happening. Sure. And the, the sub he mentioned, right, nothing, I think how he phrased it was basically John Rahm is what Liv is a reminder of what Liv aspires to be. Anthony Kim is a reminder of what it actually is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. and that's it is so yeah. in 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 that respect if he continues to come out here and and finish 33 shots off the pace it delegitimizes what what live is trying to become right because it is a sideshow it's like hey, we mm-hmm. you know, this is 
It is mm-hmm. a spectacle. It's and it's an appearance. It's the definition of an exhibition then at right. that point. It, it, it truly is. And so in and like I said, you know, it's it, it harms the brand if he continues to play like this. It ultimately may prove to be a bad decision in the long run. But again, right. Right, if he turns this into an A, then it then it's the best decision ever. Um, yeah, and I I'm not going to suggest that the the current world rankings as the system exists right now today is the best answer that's out there. I don't think it is. There has to be a a better answer. But <laughs> you know, it's like at some point in time, are you bidding against yourself? Like you you know, if I'm in Liv's shoes and I'm sitting there saying, hey we're trying to legitimize, we're trying to work towards this. What are things that we could meaningfully do that are constructive in terms of finding a way to do it other than just pounding our fists and saying, give us points, give us points. Look at how good we all are. You know, we're world-class players. Give us points. Okay, fine. Well, you know what? Let's do this. Let's take a guy that hasn't played golf in 12 years, pay him a lot of money, and let him come be a wild card for the rest of the season. And anybody like that idea? Oh yeah, let's do it. It's great. Uh, uh, I struggle with that one. I struggle with that one. So we'll see. AK, great to have you back. I hope the best for you. I really do. I want him to do well. I'd like to see him at an A, not an F. Quick questions, Tony. Quick questions, maybe not quick answers. Quick questions. First question is this. Hey, and eh, some of these came from readers. Most of them came from readers. Scoured the interwebs. Some of them came from me. One of them did. But the first one is this. We stamp lofts on wedges. Why not irons? Why would we? I I just, this one, I I get like it. And the argument is, well, like loft jacking is cheating. And so if you don't put the loft on, if you put the loft on it, everybody knows the truth, et cetera, et cetera, right? It stops manufacturers from hiding the trickery, which the specs are published anyway. It's not trickery, but if, if loft right. becomes the thing, does anybody reasonably expect, if I handed you one company's 37 degree club and another company's 37 degree club, would you expect that they would both go the same distance? Yes, they're both 37s. Yeah, they should no. go exactly the right. same distance so every you gotta, time. You know, different they're center of gravity locations, different soul designs, all of this thing that, you know, launch and spin characteristics, if you will. So much more goes into this equation than just loft. Stamping, I mean, it's it's no more meaningful to put loft on the bottom of a club than it is to stamp a seven. Right, right. No. What... What do you say to people that should? That are, they say, hey, I I think you should. I think you should put, you know, Okay, go, go get a stamping kit and, you know, stamp whatever you want on them. Um, but <laughs> I it, might it, do that. I, I might mean, the, remember Ben Hogan, when Ben five. Hogan came back the first time it came back, it tried that, and it was just yeah. it was confusing because, again, right, if you go more confusing than good because if you right. had a, you know, well – Again, stick to the 37 degree example. If you had a 37 degree club in your previous set and yeah. a Ben Hogan club, for example, stamped 37, right. and you go, oh, that's the translation? Maybe, maybe not. I can tell you for me, it wasn't one for one. So knowing the loft didn't actually help anything. It actually created more confusion because what was my six was now my seven or something like that. So right. I, no benefit, no benefit whatsoever. No. Other than for I the think, people who go, oh, you know, there's integrity in, in, in stating a loft on a club. Yeah. I, it's no more meaningful than the word tungsten. <laughs> tungsten, if, and you know, if tungsten's in that club, it's probably stamped or laser engraved or on there somehow. They Manufacturers want, want you to know tungsten. There's, tungsten, there's tungsten in here. My two thoughts on that. Number one is, you think about, like, players starting the game. Like, you learn incrementally hey this is what you know like the the one time a year my wife will go out and play golf be like hey do i use my seven or my five or my nine or my you know seven or whatever it is use your 34 exactly so not only is it twice as much information you know nine versus hey use your 34 it doesn't communicate it nearly as well and so then you grow up like that or whatever it's like hey that's what you're used to. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, whatever the case 
is and the other thing to me is the stamped loft tells such a little part of the story you know it doesn't tell the anything about the cg location or the dynamic properties i just want to know what that club does because of the material it's made out of because of the size of the head cg position so on and so forth like you said this would be kind of a really really cool thing we, we could take two you know take two seven irons right both at exactly 32 degrees of loft in entirely different constructions you know like you could take like we did this a little bit with uh with titleist imagine taking a t350 and a muscle back at exactly the same loft and let's see what happens Do you know what will happen, Tony? What will happen? That 350 is going to go straight <laughs> up in the air. And who knows? I mean, it, you know, it's going to, you know, because it's designed to get the ball in the air, right? And and uh, and who knows? Who knows? All right, next quick question. Joaquin Neiman, he is the one that won this week on uh, on Live, the AK's comeback. The, the dude's on a heater. So He's into aggrieved. three of the four majors poor, this year now. He just, he just stated oh. that he's into. He got an exemption, I guess, into the PGA Championship as well. The only one he would theoretically have to qualify for now is the U.S. Open. But he sounds like to me almost ungrate. I I don't know. What's your? I, I've never heard somebody who who not only got paid a ridiculous amount of money to do nothing. Right? He doesn't have to play good golf. He can finish behind Anthony Kim and still get paid. But mm-hmm. not only that, he is whining about tournaments he's in. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, <that's right. laughs> like, I'm just like, shut the hell up, man. Like <laughs> nobody, nobody is saying that OWGR has it right and you're not better than that number indicates. But come on. You're right. you're you're in three of the four. And and look. We've said this before. Like, I don't know what Greg Norman told these guys. It sounds like he made promises. I have an idea. On, yeah, like he just kind of pulled it out <laughs> of his ass idea. that they would be getting OWGR points, right? That was right. that should There's never no been assured, be right? Yeah. And so, like, look, man, you you can either take the money, the easy money, or or you can you could have stayed on tour, gotten those points, qualified for the majors easily. I'm sure. Sure, but man. Like, it's, I, I've just never seen people who should be and have talked about how great they have it and how amazing everything is and how unsatisfied they are by all of it. So I, you know what, like I'm, I'm solidly in the, uh, you know, shut the hell up. Like, what are you complaining yeah. about? Right. You got I all think... the money you could ever need. You're playing in three of the four majors. You have a chance. You can still qualify. You sure. can qualify for the other one. And guess what? If you get into yeah. that one and play well, you'll play in every other one for the foreseeable future. So it's on you, mm-hmm. man. Stop one. I think, to me, it it sets up for a really, really interesting uh, year for him in particular because Canton Ice played exceptionally well. Again, three-round tournaments, make whatever concessions you want. But now he's kind of put himself, you know, more of a bullseye. And maybe he needs that to play well. I don't know. But there's going to be, uh, you know, a, an awful lot of focus on how he does play in the major and should he play really well like you said then you qualify for the next one or it puts you in the next one you, you're exempt based on your how you play great that's i think that's probably what they want should he not play well that's where it could you know <laughs> i there are gonna be people who are gonna be very quick to the uh, world to will not be kind him, you know uh, or you know like i said just what are you setting yourself up for? I mean, imagine somebody that's ranked, you know, better, higher than a hundredth in the world, beats him in one of these events. Like, well, maybe you are the hundred best, you know, best golfer in the world. I don't know. Look, you know, so I just don't know why you'd set yourself up for super easy criticism. But again, maybe that motivates him. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I'm telling you, being being aggrieved is part of the live model, right? There's still got to be like, a, you know, it's um... yeah. All right, two more questions for you. Take equipment out. Take speed training devices out. We've talked uh, and want to continue this discussion of different parts of the golf ecosystem 
that don't necessarily get treated like equipment, but should. Right? So it's like, hey, if there's technology in your driver, there's technology in X. So my question for you is this. What would be the first non-equipment, non-training aid piece of non-golf equipment that golfers should look at to improve on course performance? That's a tough one. I mean, I think shoes when you, because there, there's a fitting aspect to shoes that, that to an extent mirrors golf clubs. It's not, and it, it goes beyond, I'm a size nine and a half, so I'm just going to have a, grab a nine and a half, but, and I'm fitted. Mm-hmm. You have things like, all right, what is, what is the structure of this shoe? Is this, is this a very stable shoe or is this a shoe that's going to move with me? And ultimately, am I the type of the way I swing? Do I benefit from an ultra stable shoe or do I need something that's going to move and bend? Yeah. You know, like, and that's why FootJoy, for example, a lot of their models now have carbon and non-carbon models, right? The carbon mm-hmm. tends to be the more stable. The other one, a little more freedom of movement. So that's, that is a lot of that piece of it is, is actually golfer dependent, like, like a golf club. So that's, I think that's what I like with. it. I like it. That was going to be my first answer too. There's going to be more stuff coming up. Like what are other things that are out there that, yeah, don't get qualified as equipment, but probably should. What's the benefit of having a correct size golf club, right? What's the benefit of different apparel, things like that? We're going to dig into that maybe in a, in a different episode moving on. But last question for the day. This one came from Andrew Burton on the Twitter spaces. He had a quote uh, or a question or a quote that he was given by uh, apparently another pro or somebody out there saying, hey, no offense, but you're probably not good enough to play a Pro V1. Yeah, and I mean... The, the is playing that, a premium ball a function of skill, I guess, is the underlying question. So the, the rest of that piece, went, and it was kind of what caught my attention, was because it's going to accentuate your mistakes. Mm-hmm. And this was one, and, and obviously we weren't in the that discussion we don't have the full context but i so i don't necessarily want to go and just totally rip the guy who said it apart but that's one of the things that it does not make sense to me fundamentally and let's let's take price off the equation right if you want to say hey you're not good enough to spend 54 dollars a dozen 55 dollars a dozen on golf balls be going to because you're going to lose so many of them and then it becomes like hey is my financial situation such that i can you know, right, yeah. pound Pro V1s yeah. into the woods all day long. That's a different piece of the discussion. Sure. The idea that it's going to accentuate a mistake baffles me to an extent. And, and I say that, like, what do we know about the Pro V1, both in terms of performance and, and how it's made, right? Okay, so it's a mid-spin, I would argue, low to mid-spin golf ball. Mm-hmm. It's trajectory, mid Again, and, and I might even go so far yeah. as to say on the low end of the mid scale. Right. And being a Pro V1, we've got, you know, we've been looking at these in Ball Labs for three generations now. I can tell you it is, if not the best, among the very best balls made anywhere in the world in terms of quality and consistency. So you don't have to right. put too much worry that you're going to have some kind of core or concent- concentricity defect that's going to make it fly offline. So if I'm thinking, what is going to accentuate my mistakes? Mm-hmm. A really poorly made golf ball. And, <laughs> and quite frankly, a lot of these two-piece balls that are supposed to fly straighter are poorly right. made. We cut them open. Right. We see the layering mistakes. They're going to accentuate your mistakes because they're going to fly offline because they're out of balance. Right. So that's that's one piece of it. Mm-hmm. Low spin. Right. It's so it's not going to fly crazy. Yeah, if, and again, gonna get away if you said you. No. if you said you shouldn't play a Pro V1 X because it's going to accentuate a mistake, I'd still be a little bit on that. Yeah. But at least I'd be like, I can see how you get there from a performance perspective because it's a higher spinning ball and it flies high. So, right. yeah. All right. It's going to stay in the air. It's going to give more opportunity to wander offline. Right. Loosely makes sense. Um, Ish. Not to the extent that like something that spins like a Kirkland or flies like a Kirkland, that would be one way. Right. Yeah, that's going to accentuate a mistake. Right. A Pro V1 is not going to accentuate a mistake. Now, you, you could argue, all right, maybe, maybe that kind of golfer would benefit from something that is lower spinning still, lower flying still. Okay, make a case for AVX as perhaps a better alternative, but the idea that 
a Pro V1 or a similarly well-constructed ball with a similar performance specification is going to yep. accentuate your mistakes, doesn't make sense to me. I, I can't Ain't gonna get happen. There. I absolutely cannot get there. I love that. And with that, stay tuned, people. There's always going to be more information coming out next week, the week after, all these kind of things. Find us, follow us on the interwebs. Let us know what questions you have. Until then, we out.